So many of you have written in about wanting to learn more about how power works, how to organize, and how to move forward really after uh, Bernie Sanders has stepped out of the primary. Where do we go from here now that we don't have a movement leader to guide us? Well, it turns out it is on us and uh, many of us have to start learning very quickly, especially those who just joined uh, the movement or are younger, you know, our futures depend on you. Uh, so one of the, the tasks that we uh, do with this show is we want to reach out to experts and learn uh, very quickly how to utilize the power that we do have. and. I don't think there could be a better expert uh, than the person who probably understands power the most and has had quite a bit of success um, and has written about it, Jane McAlevey. Uh, she is a lifelong activist and organizer, especially around the trade unions. Uh, you know her from her book, her books, uh, Raising Expectations and Raising Hell, No Shortcuts, Organizing for Power, and her most recent book, A Collective Bargain, uh, Unions Organizing and the Fight for Democracy, which is so much bigger right now than we probably would have anticipated a couple of weeks ago. Um, Jane, thank you so much for joining us. I know we had a few technical glitches, so hopefully we can uh, say all the wonderful and go even further uh, this time around. <laughs> I'm so happy to be talking to you. It's great. Um, you know, I, I think I'm just going to start with the obvious question. What power do we have right now in the movement? Yeah. I mean, I think the good news is we have the same power right now that we had, you know, three or four or five weeks ago. That's the truth. And the power we have is our capacity to unite together and stand up and fight like crazy. That hasn't changed. I mean, uh, ha having a candidate to coalesce around, I think sometimes uh, is convenient. It's helpful. Um, it gives focus to our work. But the truth is, what was interesting, and I think one of the best things about Bernie Sanders is that he himself was clear and he consistently messaged that even if he had won, it would have taken a gargantuan movement in the streets to actually move policy. That fact hasn't changed. So whether it's Biden or whoever, uh, it's going to take the same amount of heat in the streets as it was going to take if it was Bernie. It's just do we face you know tanks and bulldozers or do we not um and who knows what trump would do if trump is reelected which is a, a frightening thought but by the way one that i am i keep at the front of my head every day because i think we have to be realistic um the democrats are inept they've spent the last 45 years undermining their own electoral base that's the destruction of the trade unions the most uh capable part of the base that elected Democrats at the local level, state level, and federally, uh, you know, for 80, 90 years in this country, they've just been systematically destroying. So whether or not the Democrats can pull off November, I think it's a huge question right now. I mean, I really think that Sanders was the candidate to beat Trump. Um, it's obvious that, that the party itself was gonna do damage to him, which they just did. But he was certainly a better candidate to go up against Trump. The COVID disaster, um, which is ongoing, m may give us an opening uh, to actually take down Trump with even a shitty candidate, which is what we're left with at the moment. So, because I think with 17 million people filing unemployment claims, that's 17 million people filing unemployment claims. and. I saw an estimate this morning that that 20 we're at 20 percent unemployment in the United States right now. 20 percent. We're going to be close to Great Depression numbers. Um, and quite honestly, what happened in the Great Depression is that FDR was elected, and FDR was not. I mean, it wasn't like people elected FDR thinking that he was the Bernie Sanders of the time or realizing that he was going to become the FDR that he became. And that's what I take comfort from. Let's imagine we elect Biden. Just imagine that the crisis is so deep that people finally get really angry. And what I'm hoping, by the way, the scenario I'm hoping for is that the pandemic calms down, you know, soon, next couple of months. Uh, we're allowed back out because I think what's going to happen when we're allowed back out is that there's going to be a wave of strikes in this country that's going to make 2018 and 2019 look tame. And I think it's going to be in the healthcare sector. And I think that nurses, registered nurses who are being asked to kill themselves right now, and hospital workers, every tech, 
um, everyone moving a ventilator around, everyone touching them, every healthcare worker who is behaving like every firefighter, but he's not going to get that kind of recognition, by the way, they're just not. Let's just have a right. general discussion at some point. But every nurse and hospital worker running into work right now with no protective equipment on because they believe in saving people, which is the same exact dynamic of a firefighter running into a burning house. Like that's what every nurse and hospital worker has been asked to do for the last month in this country with no protective equipment. And what I'm hearing from the thousands of people that I've spent my life helping organize in the healthcare sector uh, is we should prepare for like tires burning in the street. And it'd be nice, by the way, if we could get a more ecologically perfect thing to burn. But I really think that there's gonna be, there's gonna be a fight back that's gonna be fierce. And I think that the two years of strikes that we saw in 2018 and 2019, like set the stage, reminded a whole new generation of workers who haven't seen strikes, that when this is over and we can all come out again and they start moving the austerity, cut back, roll back, right. we're gonna make all you people pay again, we're gonna make the working class pay for the failures of the 1% again, I think it's gonna be a, a kind of a hell no. I think if we do our work right, and this is where the energy of a lot of the Sanders campaigners I hope go and supporters go, is into unleashing a, um, a flurry of strikes in this country learning how to do strike support, learning how to jump in there and actually get the whole community behind um, what I anticipate is going to be some strikes coming out of the healthcare sector, strikes in the education sector. Um, we know we're seeing strikes in sort of the just-in-time logistics sector. Those three sectors are like the most important sectors there are right now in this country. And two out of three of them, which is healthcare and education, I think two out of three of them have the capacity and are primed uh, to go. I think in the logistics sector, there's an amazing potential for power coming back to the power discussion, or we're in the power discussion, but really being clear about power. The logistics sector, the Amazon, the, the all the just-in-time stuff, the delivery people, that's got great potential for power, but we haven't seen it realized yet um, because the infrastructure has not been there yet uh, for people. Right. You have the national nurses, you have the teachers' unions, which it, especially the membership base is is very educated in how to organize and, and they're right. more radical than say like uh you know SEIU which the members are but the 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 leadership is is not quite there. <laughs> yeah. Um, leadership of most of the national unions by the right. way uh, as evidenced by did you see I'm sorry it's the first time I'm talking about it in public we should talk about it for a minute. Did you read that opinion piece that four labor leaders published in the USA Today several years ago. Yes, you're rolling your eyes, so is everyone I know. I mean, if that's an indication of what the national leadership's position is right now, to like celebrate a handful of capitalists for, you know, I sitting, down and, <laughs> I don't know. sitting down and talking about following safety protocols, um, it was an outrageous opinion piece. And so I think I think, honestly, from the bottom up, which is where the strike activity has been coming for the last couple of years, if we see an increase in that, if we see local players and local and regional and state level workers taking action in the education and healthcare sectors, where I think it's really possible, I think it's going to get really interesting. And I think that that actually has the potential to shift the balance of power heading into the election, but more important, coming out of the election. Like part of what I think needs to happen in terms of the power structure analysis, in fact, I think honestly, the thing that has to happen given the current power analysis and the austerity that's coming is way more strikes as fast as possible. Um, in 1932, so when FDR wins in, in 1932, and I outlined this in a collective bargain uh, in a really succinct chapter, um, the election happens in 32, Progressives weren't rallying around FDR. Like, he could have been Biden, I guess, on a bad day. Or, I don't know, I mean, or he was an oligarch. I mean, it's not like we have to remember exactly. he turned on the people who basically got him elected. Exactly. And then what happened was the smart leftists in the trade union movement, who were mostly not in unions, who mostly didn't have the right to unionize, it's pre the 1935 National Relations Act, and it's what leads to it, is they decide in key geographic areas of the United States and in key sectors, so those are two words, key geographies, key sectors, this is power structure analysis. They made the decision to start holding massive strikes. They essentially brought many, I saw a series of many general strikes happened in 1932, 1933, and 1934, which most people don't know a thing about, because most people think 
National Labor Relations Act passes, and if they think at all about this, right? They think 1935, National Labor Relations Act passes under Franklin Delano Roosevelt, key part of the New Deal, leaves out a bunch of people, black people, okay, you know, some gender issues there, but a lot of people get the right to strike for the first time, a lot more than didn't have it, um, get the right to strike. In theory, it's a theoretical right to strike under the National Relations Act. And so 36 happens, and you see 36 and 37 in Detroit, Flint, the streets, the auto sector, the sit down strikes. Most people think that's how it began, but it actually began in 32, 33, and 34 with the illegal strikes that happened in the cities where leftists in the labor movement calculated one, workers were ready to go across sectors like in Minneapolis, like in Seattle, like in Oakland, right, in key, key right. geographic areas. And that two, that the, the sort of troops, the dogs, the hoses, and the guns would not be called out on them in certain key areas. That's the same power analysis we need to do right now. Where are the places in this country this time next year, let alone this summer and this fall, right, challenging the election itself, but like even after the election, because we know this crisis is not ending tomorrow, where are the places where we think at the base level there's enough workers ready to go in enough sectors to start causing what union organizers like to call a serious crisis. Like, how do we create a crisis for capital? Well, it is, I mean, in a state like New York, just to, just to, you know, we've seen a lot of this happen in red states, which is powerful. Um, but you know, some of them are right to work states, and 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 you know, you have Wisconsin, which of course has a long history of of this 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 power struggle. Um, even though there's such Republican rule there, and it's like the test, the test case. You know, they they test everything out there. But in a state like New York, which is a union state, it's democratically run, um, you know, Democratic governors, uh, legislature and, and Senate and city, that seems like a prime place, especially with COVID, especially because the communities that are affected are, are frontline. I mean, part of the reason why you've got that belt from Queens to Brooklyn is because so many of the people who are out there delivering are, are being, uh, you know, put in contact with it or they don't have access to the right medical care or there's underlying health issues. So... I mean, these are the workers. These are literally the workers. So in a state like New York, wouldn't you think that that kind of power would push up against people like Cuomo, where they would have to respond? Because that is their base. It's not yeah. like the Republicans that, that don't have strong labor rules. I think so. And mostly, I think it'll be hard. I mean, look, Cuomo is no real friend of working people. Sorry. Right. Sorry to break the news to everyone. Uh, no, we've covered that one on the show. <laughs> not a surprise on your show. I know. It's a surprise for a lot of people, though. Whenever I say that, Cuomo, are you kidding me? Like, the guy is gutting Medicaid as the COVID crisis is happening? Whatever. So, but what he's, what he's not going to have the capacity to do, I don't believe, uh, is call out the National Guard against nurses uh, in scrubs and healthcare workers. Uh, and educators um, on the streets of New York or in the, or frankly in upstate, there's plenty of, plenty of heat in Buffalo, by the way, there's some amazing nurse organizing going on up there and other work. So I think that's what I mean by power and power structure analysis. If we start, and if the generation coming out of the Bernie campaign starts to really analyze where are the places that workers can, can, can be ready to go, how can people who are not yet in the union struggle, start building alliances right now, start building operations to bring the broader community into the fight, right? Because that's key, every big strike. If we don't have the entire public with us, we're not going to win, right? Like we actually need the public on the streets with us. Really strong unions like the Los Angeles teachers were able to bring the community with them because they had strategically been working with the community for several years leading up to that strike. And they still are. And there's a lot of unions who are smart at the local level and really realizing, including even SAU locals. I mean, this is the dynamic about the American labor movement that's really important for people to understand. There's the national position holders. They hold positions. Then there's the leadership and the rank and file out in the field. And in a lot of places, the rank and file leadership uh, has kind of had it. You know what I mean? And they're looking around the country and going, huh, Marriott, the United, the United Here workers won the Marriott strike. The educators are winning the educator strikes, red state and blue states. Even the AT&T workers pulled off a victory in nine southern states. Um, there's a lot of, you know, the, the, the United Food and Commercial Workers and the Stop and Shop strike in New England. I have to say that's an example where a union was not really ready. That union was not really ready for the Stop and Shop strike in any way compared to like the LA teachers were ready for their strike or the Oakland teachers mm -hmm. or the fall Chicago teachers in their magnificent rerun of the strike again this past fall. There's some unions that are really ready for it. They're building for it. They're getting ready. There are some unions, and I think in some ways analyzing power and the fights to come, where it's just, if we're honest, which I think everyone can be and must be in these moments, 
They weren't. The United Food and Commercial Workers were not ready for the stop and shop strike. And here's what happened, which was magnificent. And it's a sign of things to come, I hope, as someone who has lived through two and a half decades of internecine warfare among unions. What happened in the New England stop and shop strike was that a lot of unions around New England who are who are well organized saw that strike coming and literally threw down and said, we're going to put all the internecine warfare aside. And there's a really strong state federation of labor in Massachusetts. Again, kind of rare. There's actually a strong one in Maine. There's a handful of places where the state federations of labor function like they're supposed to. Um, and it started in Massachusetts and the Massachusetts Federation of Labor, which is actually a pretty decent statewide federation, said, everyone cut the bullshit, everyone stop fighting, everyone in the unions in this state that knows how to actually strike is going to go help those workers win. Mm -hmm. And there was a huge act of solidarity that broke out where the organizers from the nurses unions, the organizers from the building trades, building trades are progressive and good up in Boston, like a whole bunch of highly skilled organizers kind of quietly just like threw down and went to help the workers in the stop and shop struggle, which is part of why people pulled it off. That's one. So solidarity, you know, as we know, hello, solidarity works. Two, and it was people trading skill sets. Two, the public completely rose up around those workers in the stop and shop struggle, which should be an indicator to the uh, food supply chain of what's coming for them. Two, the public before COVID, before we were asking grocery store workers to give up their life to collect cash to feed people, right? Like people were already siding with the stop and shop workers. People have been siding in red states and blue states with workers on strike. I think the public is ready to support people, but that needs to be organized, right? You can't just be like, oh, there's public support. And this is where the Bernie, a lot of the Bernie energy I hope is gonna go is into both going into workplaces that are strategic. So what should young people who are working for Bernie who might need to go into the workforce still do? Go into the logistics sector, go into the healthcare sector, go into the education sector. They will continue to be strategic sectors moving forward where people can come in, get good training, uh, and figure out how to lead a new wave of massive strikes in this country because we're gonna need it. That's the power analysis. If you look at the Supreme Court, shift to the next, like we're done. Like the Supreme Court is gonna un, un, undo like 50 years of settled law. They've already done some of it, they're gonna do more of it. So the courts are done. Just forget, I feel like the courts are just done. I mean, um, forget, forget the fight over the courts, just to be clear. No, 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 just, for, just give up on the idea that lawsuits and advocacy work right. anymore. You know right. what I mean? Like, forget it. No, we should fight about the courts, but like, we don't have any, we're near the power we need to fight. You know, we just gotta keep building the base right now. And for, so all those lawsuits, all the advocacy strategies, I mean, McConnell owns the federal bench at this point, practically, right, with the number of judges he's been appointing. So the judicial system is going to be a disaster for us for a long time. Your lifetime, my lifetime, sorry to say it, for a lot of lifetimes, it's going to be a bad court. Um, and the electoral process, like, an, you know, it's like a chicken and egg thinking like, well, we just, well, I always say to people, well, how are you going to do it? And they say, well, we just need to overturn Citizens United and get campaign financing correct. And I'm like, Okay, and what's your plan for that? Yes. There's really only one plan right now, and the plan involves workers taking massive strike actions. And that is still within our reach, and we can still do it. I, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about how we got here, too, because I think um, so much of this comes down to really your, uh, you know, your coming of age, where your activism has been. You've been right there on the front lines as a witness and, and opponent to... Um, many of the folks who sort of designed, I guess, this, where we are today. I mean, it's not just that we have neoliberals. We have the Koch brothers who started organizing in the late 70s and, and, and early 80s with their money uh, to take over the legislatures, to you know, eventually win over the courts. Um, you know, they, they knew that the demographics were working against them, as did probably, I mean, uh, the neoliberals see now that the demographics you know, may not necessarily work with them. So they have to out strategize so that they stay in power and then they can control the masses because the demographics are really the masses, right? So looking at, at like the late seventies and early eighties, um, this is also the time when, when unions, there was a crackdown with unions. You know, the, the, the Democrats eventually pulled away from uh, uh, putting money into state parties. And, and that's kind of where that pipeline of talent would come from, where you found the organizers who knew how to fight every single time. And, the one thing we're hearing from young people right now that were involved with Bernie is, I want to be involved. I just don't know how. And and a lot of that is because this pipeline um, has been uh, completely, 
I mean, barely exist, let's be honest, with, with exception to states where there's a real union presence. So how do people develop these skills that you have been teaching? Um, you know, where do they go first to, to, yeah. to learn about how to move power? Yeah, uh, it's a really good question because um, the infrastructure really has been decimated uh, in some ways. I mean, let's just say one word about what existed sort of before 1970 on, on the sort of progressive side and then come back to like, where can people go? So um, in, in my second book, in No Shortcuts, I sort of give this my whole, you know, it's like my PhD dissertation. I give the whole analysis of like everything I'd learned as an organizer. I just went and then like regurgitated, read a bunch of stuff and then put it back out into No Shortcuts. Um, and went looking in the academy, like took some time to try and figure out, was my theory that the right wing took all their lessons from the civil rights women in the trade union movement of the 30s through the late 60s, the right wing sort of said, ah, oh, it's the base, stupid. Like we actually need to go organize a base of people um, so that we look legitimate and that there's actually a base out there. They chose two sectors. They chose, they sort of built the National Rifle Association to be like a grassroots operation. And if people don't think that's grassroots, they're crazy. That is not grass tops. The NRA is a base organization, right? They've got real people in large numbers who are willing to act and they built the evangelical church. So at that exact same time, sadly, the progressives kind of do a, a stupid moment, like which is we're paying the price for it now. And it's why there's no infrastructure and why there's no pipeline. The sort of progressives think, oh, look, Okay, we won the Civil Rights Act, we won the Voting Rights Act, we won the Clean Water Act, we won the Clean um, Air Act. Uh, you know, we forced Nixon to sign these things. We've got the Title IX amendments. You know, women got a few gains in there. Okay, I got to play sports. Happy, happy, happy. I got to play sports. Okay, whatever. You know, anyway, the things we considered huge victories. But so, um, and our side said, well, we won all these things. All we have to do now is like hire a bunch of staff, a bunch of lobbyists move into Washington and implement our federal laws. And we systematically on our side began to dismantle the emphasis of base building out in the field. So for about 40 years, we were contributing to our own decline by deprioritizing that which the right wing was prioritizing, which was base building. Was now, that because final... of greed or was it, I mean, was, um, 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 was it like stupidity? Was it an accident? Was it a lack of foresight? I mean, how, how could the, this party that was a union party, I and mean, let's not forget that they also kicked out union members from the party. Was yeah. it because they wanted to concentrate money towards, um, I don't know, the ad buyers or something? I mean, that's what it is now. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, you know, I think it's, um, I think it's multiple fold. I think the first big blow was McCarthyism. And I, I feel like we don't under, we don't yeah. pay enough attention to how much damage that did. So every smart leftist, and certainly if, if it, I mean, I always think to myself, uh, you know, if I was doing the same work then that I've been doing for the last 20 years now, I would have been thrown out of the union and or put in jail and all the things that happened uh, during that period. So I think we I think we start by understanding that that the long the intent, the primary intent of McCarthyism was partly about uh, keeping the Jim Crow South, the Jim Crow South. Right. And the, the weapon for them was to destroy the trade unions because the trade unions were forcibly helping to integrate the South. This is like part of the story I tell in a collective bargain. I go back to the origins of why they were doing what they were doing um, when McCarthyism begins, 46, 47, 48, 49, and then 50s hit. And they decide the Jim Crow folks team up again with the corporate uh, right in the North and say, we gotta stop these unions because they're taking away your profits and they're integrating the South. And that's a big problem. So they set out to destroy the unions. They create McCarthyism. They make up whether or not you're in the party. It doesn't really matter, right? We know how they. We know what. We know what they did. What most people don't realize is that they gutted 10,000 of the smartest leftists from the trade union movement. So that sets up this like period of dull, boring business unionism, where the unions, you know, in the 60s, start to play nice, and they think it's like a social compact they have with corporations, and they, they're just going to keep getting these nice contracts. That was a huge, huge misread of history as some of the national trade union leaders in the 1960s were thinking, hey, we're going to keep getting these contracts. You know, we can work with these guys now. We, we, we've got the framework for being legitimate players in the economy and in politics. Meanwhile, the right was off making plans to launch a second offensive, which was 
unleashing an army of union busting consultants in the early 1970s that then set up the Reagan election to say, we're going to finally gut the unions, right? And the final wave of that is now with the public sector, Wisconsin, which you were on. But so I think there a lot of it was self-inflicted wounds. Like we actually just did some serious damage to our side, but that damage was set up by McCarthyism taking the left out of the labor movement. So the labor movement becomes a more conservative, more business oriented force. We have a little glimmer of hope in the 70s from the civil rights movement coming into the public sector of the trade union movement. Then Reagan hits, and that's the next excuse for conservative trade union leaders to think, oh, well, we can't go on strike anymore. I mean, they're going to replace all the workers. So it's like, it's both real, but it's also an excuse to like once again dull down the militancy of the trade union movement. And it's, you know, it's not until 2012 in Chicago, really have to give them the credit, Chicago Teachers 2012, light the fire that takes off in 2018 and I think is lit and running. So now the question is, where do young people or where do people, but particularly a new generation of young folks, 35 and under were my favorite numbers, really like age 35 and under across every Russian demographic in the, in the polling, where do like the 35 and under folks go to get training? It's a super important question. They have to look for the unions where strikes have happened. They have to look for the unions where uh, where there's serious organization being built, where there's a small d democratic structure inside the union. And it's generally not going to the national unions. And in fact, the national unions aren't even running organizer training programs the way they were even 20 years ago. Wow. 25, yeah, seriously at all. Like in, in the early 1990s, you could apply for a series of different weekend long, um, like apprenticeship testing programs, a three day program to get training where unions would see, okay, this person's kind of good, let's bring them in. A lot of those entry pipelines are gone. So now you have to look around and say, you know, can I go to the being rebuilt Midwest Academy of Organizing in Chicago? I would look there, by the way, I'm, I'm saying that I would like to look there. Can I go to, let's look at all the education unions where there's been strikes. Let's look at Unite Here, a union that consistently strikes from Marriott strike. Um, parts of the Communication Workers of America within it, right? It's a complicated union like SEIU is. Some of it totally dynamic. Some of it, um, you know, needs some work. So I think that that people trying to get in need to look at the unions where there's a small democratic structure. And then honestly, a lot of them need to take jobs yeah. in healthcare, logistics, and education. Like actually take jobs in those three key strategic sectors where they will continue to be leading sectors of the dominant US economy right now. They can't be outsourced that easily. So really where those young folks need to go is in jobs and strategic sectors. And then I would argue, get the training internally, whether it's go to a DSA training, lining them up, going to uh, Midwest Academy, looking at labor notes. Like there's a bunch of places where you can look, get real training. You know, I mean, I'm not a show for my, I don't care if they photocopy my books. I always say that, go to the damn library and take it out. There's not about selling them, but you'll get the basic idea of what you're looking for. Um, and it's important to go to the right union. Because if you go to the wrong union, not only will you not get trained, uh, you may get, uh, really unmotivated. <laughs> so, you know? so that's interesting because you, um, you know, it sort of leads me to to this question that is is a question that we don't really talk about enough on the left. But I think historically we could see that there's a lot of evidence of this. Whether it's the right bringing in uh, union busting consultants who are operating, you know, uh, nobody knew that that their colleagues were union busters or or moving all the way through. You know, there's there's lots of 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 forms of sabotage um, that those in power will put into organizing. They will um, try to divide organizers up so that they're not forming solidarity by using, you know, cultural issues or race to divide. Racism, um, yeah, all of it. And, and we see that on the left right now. I mean, uh, I think a lot of young people, we talked about this before, that um, th I don't want to say they're falling for it, but there's a lot of provoked language out there and sometimes even our younger leaders are falling for um, tactics that, you know, they might excite a base, they might raise money to be fair, um, but it's ultimately not very helpful for the end goal and it pits us against each other. So I want to ask you, since you are this like expert on politics, a little bit about controlled opposition. I know that's like a weird term that people throw out there and it's a little conspiratorial sometimes, but there, there are organizations, I mean, neoliberalism is essentially controlled opposition, right? I mean, how how do we 
think about those things when they're organizations that might be our allies sometimes and work with our candidates, but you know, maybe other times they 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 support candidates, uh, you know, our our opposition or attack us. Um, there's a lot of that. I mean, we have to be real. There's a lot of that. And how do we maneuver when we're trying to build solidarity? And sometimes there are friends and sometimes they're not. Yeah, I'm just not. In, I mean, I, I to me, to me, the most important thing that we can do, the most important thing that people who are new to the work can do is take a job in a strategic sector in an area where, the, where there's a good union or, or really an intent on going in with a bunch of their friends, like pulling a bunch yeah. of people and applying for jobs, going in someplace, doing some study groups, getting in touch with those of us who know how to teach them, right, and train them, uh, and either forming new unions or helping be part of reform slates of existing unions at the local level. Right. And here's why I say this, to get to your point. For all the frustrations that we all may have, and certainly me, I mean, all of my books, you know, labor leadership considers them to be very critical of them. Um, I consider them to be tough, tough, friendly criticism, right? I mean, this is like the movement I'm in, and, and I'm deeply committed to it. But what I think about learning control that position, all this stuff, what I think is learn how to do it. So what's beautiful about union campaigns what's different about trade union campaigns than any other sector of the progressive movement or the left is that when you try to form a union, you have to get past the bullshit of the divide mm -hmm. and conquer people because they're in there every day. So one of the stories I tell in the new book about helping to organize thousands of hospital workers in 2016 in Philadelphia, in greater Philadelphia, as part of a large campaign that a whole bunch of us were involved in, that, you know, where workers won. Um, actually, the biggest organizing campaign in the United States in 2016 was in Philadelphia, and it was a hell of a campaign. And what you what people learn in these kind of campaigns is that we had professional union busters, we had IRI Inc. This is not just neoliberalism, this is like what well, although it's part of it, right? But IRI Inc. is now becoming more of a well-known name because it's who Google has hired. So Google hired IRI Inc. That was a New York Times story, and the story was in early December. And IRI Inc., as soon as I saw the New York Times story, it was like all sorts of people were sending it to me because IRI Inc. is who we were going up against in Philadelphia in the hospital campaign in 2016. Mm -hmm. So obviously we know how to overcome these guys and <laughs> I have to say my two favorite words, which is method and discipline. Like we were going up against IRI Inc. in 2016 in a brutal series of rounds of just warfare um, in the hospitals. Um, where they had in one hospital in Einstein, they had 18 full-time union busters who came in to do the massive divide and conquer. Yeah. And this is why when people like when Uber super lefty people say like, we don't need organizers, you know, the rank and file is just going to rise up. I'm like, yeah, to a firing squad. Give me a break. When you have 18 professional union busters hiding behind management, yeah. going in and driving wedges, like looking for every wedge they can drive, race, gender, class, immigration, race, gender, class, immigration, and driving those wedges to be successful, which we were to be successful, you have to learn the methods and the strategies that that when you wake up every morning, you have the capacity to actually build solidarity. Like you have to actively construct solidarity because there's people actively working to deconstruct solidarity. So our side has to get really good at actively constructing little action by little action that unifies people even up against really stiff divide and conquer opposition. And the best of union organizers know how to do this. Like we actually know how to do this. And certainly not just me, there are a lot of really good organizers in this country. You just don't know their names, but I got a ton of colleagues who I've worked with in every campaign and we know what the hell we're doing and there's method and discipline. And that's what the Bernie generation needs to learn. Like get that skill, get that training, because whether it comes to the political, like. I feel like we can take that skill set and we export it. So when I get lent out to political campaigns, which we do, right? If you're a full-time person in the trade union movement, your union will pick you if you win a lot of really hard fought union elections and you will get lent out, right, to a campaign. Um, and we often get lent out to the hardest campaigns because we actually understand how to overcome divide and conquer tactics. Um, and that's the kind of tactics that people need to learn for us to defeat massive austerity that's coming down the pike. Um, I know you have to go soon, but I, I want to ask you a little bit about the difference between solidarity and I believe you you, you used the term, is it mass organizing? Was that the right term? 
Mass organizing, yeah. Well, I mean, for me, I'll tell you what, I like to talk about how do you build unbreakable solidarity? Like those words to me really matter. So how do you build solidarity and how do you build unbreakable solidarity, which is what you need for a strike? Uh, because the union buses are coming, right? So when we, when we have an approach of doing large scale organizing, there's an entire theory we have. Um, one part of it's called going to the biggest worst, which is the opposite of what the feminist movement did in the 1970s, trying to pass the ERA. And let me explain what that is. What a lot of activists do, and this is a mistake, please don't do this, activists left, young people. What a lot of activists do is get comfortable mostly talking to people who agree with them. Right. That's what the feminist movement did. I and mean, there were a lot of things wrong. Racism inside the white woman dominated movement, tone deaf on race, tone deaf on class. But like what activists did was went to like the easy states to pass, to try and pass the Equal Rights Amendment, got really encouraged. Like, oh, look, we got one state, two, three, five, 10, 15, 20, not realizing that those were the easy states. And if you're a union organizer, you start with the hardest states, mm. because what you know in a union campaign is if we can win the hardest departments to win, we're going to win this campaign because we're going to save the easier to do work for later in the campaign. Because if you can win the hard part of the campaign, the hard part of the turf, you can actually pull off the whole election because the easier part of the turf is going to come along with you in the end. So um, there's so much that people trying to figure out electoral work can learn from trading organizers. That's part of why I keep writing the books. Um, but method and discipline matters. Having a theory of power matters. Having a, a, a disciplined method by which you do strategy and that you don't do the strategy until you've done power structure analysis in every campaign and every fight. Like these are all learnable skills uh, and people are desperate for them um, on the progressive side of the aisle, or we're just gonna keep like engaging in wishful thinking and thinking we're gonna have some magic solution and there ain't no magic solution. There's like a bunch of really hard work that we have to do. We can do it. I actually really think we can win. And if the energy that was going into Bernie's campaign goes into people going into strategic workplaces, in strategic sectors, in strategic geographies, in very short time, like I'm thinking 2022, we can cause holy hell if not 2021, but definitely 2022 and we need it. And that's not far off. I couldn't agree more. I mean, people feel defeated this time around that may have joined uh, the election this time or feel defeated after two elections. But I mean, my one point of wisdom that I can I can personally say is uh, the neoliberal establishment has never been challenged this way. I yeah. mean, they flexed whatever muscles they had. And, and like Joe Biden was it I know. Uh, to defeat Bernie Sanders. But, you know, when you really break it down step by step, have a strategy, understand who you're up against, which is what I really appreciate appreciate about your work whether it's electorally or otherwise, you know, it's, and you start kind of like picking those battles, you know, strategic battles, it's much more doable. And, and if you win the, the hard ones, like you said, it kind of, it'll have a domino effect, in, I believe, a domino effect. So um, I appreciate your work. Thank you very much for joining us. I, I, I hope you can come back on because I, I have so many more questions for you. And I'm sure- When we audience... all come out again, you know, let's have a long discussion. It'll be really great. Definitely. Absolutely. Appreciate you. Glad you're Thank glad you. you're doing what you're doing now. It's so nice to have a woman doing an interview. <laughs> and a smart one. Of course you're smart, you know what I mean? But it's nice to have like a really smart woman. So keep up the good work and I'm happy to come back sometime.